Welcome to StartupRad.io, your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hey guys, hello and welcome everybody to a tradition of StartupRad.io. We are here today for you and bringing you the FinTech Review 2023. That is an annual tradition in all the podcasts I have hosted ever since 2014, where we usually get together in a live recording that was also streamed, where we talked to fintech entrepreneurs, thought leaders, um, and other influential people in the fintech space and heard from them what was important to them in the past year. Right now, it turned out that the schedules of all the people are quite full. So we had to do the recordings piece by piece and we don't get like a full on discussion, unfortunately. Nonetheless, it's very interesting. We do have together here Paolo, Luca, Ivan and Kimo and each and every one of them will talk a little bit different about their perspective of fintech banking, insurtech, embedded finance and CBDC in 2023, and maybe a little bit about their outlook 2024. But enough said for me, I would like to welcome Paolo. Ciao Jorn, I'm always happy to be here and the fintech review is my most important appointment of the year. Luca? Hey Jörn, or Gude, as I already said last time. It's a pleasure to be back. Ivan? Hey Joel, great to be speaking. I've been great. 2023 has been an exciting year and really looking forward to 2024 to do more great things. And last but not least, Kimo. I'm doing very well. Happy Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Really glad to be here today. And before you ask, the order I welcome to people has only to do it by when they could make time in the busy schedule for our recording. Paolo, you are with the IBM Institute for Business Value, the global thought leader on fintech banking and capital markets. What have been your perspective of 2023 and maybe a little bit your outlook 2024? And for everybody who likes Paolo, he is the most frequent guest we have on our podcast, and he is a steady guest since, I do believe, at least five years in our FinTech review. You'll find down here in the show notes many of the books he's talking about and he has published as well as his research paper. Sorry, Paolo, here's the stage to you. 2023 was a year plenty of news uh, and advancements in technology, so it's difficult uh, to pick up uh, two or three of the most important. But if I may, I want to focus on um, a couple of elements. Uh, one is generative AI, and the other one is uh, the rise of embedded finance. Let's start from generative AI. It's uh, on uh, everybody's mouth. Everybody's talking about that. Everybody wants to do it. Uh, Effectively, something is happening. Um, we've been talking a lot uh, through the years about the capability of uh, building a conversational bank, but we knew that the technology was uh, somehow limited in the capability of creating the connection with the consumers and the final users. Now this is changing. It doesn't mean that we are there yet uh, fully, but effectively we made a huge quantum leap in that direction. I think that uh, uh, we can all see the history of uh, banking uh, investments in technology, which means opportunities uh, for the startup uh, this way. Uh, there were there are three periods uh, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, and I would call them a period of uh, digitalization outright, uh, a period of personalization with data, and a period of communication with AI. So the first period is... Uh, uh, everyone's interest uh, and necessity to digitalize uh, banking uh, by launching uh, a digital app uh, or a digital access. So typically that means uh, taking what uh, existed or existed at the time, lifting shift in a sense, that's what many banks did uh, on cloud technology and basically power uh, with uh, more capability, uh, digital connectivity with uh, a world of consumers that um, 
uh, could be potentially growing uh, uh, on the digital app compared to uh, what has been happening in the past with the the, uh, the website. So that is when we saw effectively a lot of investments into um, architectures that can operate on cloud, uh, so cloud technology, the hybrid cloud concept, because a uh, lot of uh, information is uh, basically hosted on prem anyway, uh, like transactions through core banking, and the uh, cloud becomes more and more relevant uh, at the point of contact uh, with the client, so powering up the, the mobile app. So there's the first period we call it the digitalization of right. But then uh, banks realized that just being on cloud uh, and having a digital app was not enough. If we look at the uh, net promoter scores of many banks, uh, they fare uh, very poorly compared to other industries. Um, that means uh, it is not enough to be on digital uh, to create uh, an entertaining and engaging enough experience uh, that uh, uh, pleases the consumers and pleases the consumers means invest consumers uh, to effectively interact uh, and consume on digital. And that's when banks understood that they had to personalize uh, the digital experience. So, so that's when uh, the artificial intelligence in terms of uh, machine learning and deep learning uh, started becoming relevant uh, in banking investments uh, because all banks, uh, the same with the startups, they started operating on mobile, needed to consume existing data that are part of core banking systems and new data which are typically outside core banking systems in order to make that digital proposition more relevant in front of the consumer. So that is basically the last, let's say, five, uh, uh, seven years of personalization as a mantra, uh, leveraging data, leveraging traditional artificial intelligence techniques in order to personalize what has been put on digital for the client's consumption. But here and again, uh, and as I have, you know, well, uh, ex well explained in all my literature, especially the last one, banks and fintech on platform economies, uh, that might not be enough because uh, mobile technology, which is uh, this one, is a technology of the demand. That means that the people may go on Amazon uh, because they want to buy one of my books and then my Amazon may, may offer something else, but, um, People typically don't go on Google to look for the next investment opportunity. It's more complex for the majority of people. They need to get into a conversation, which makes a lot of important revenues uh, of banking uh, and of uh, driven uh, uh, marketplace. Basically, products are pushed to clients. So the question is, when you move on cloud, uh, when you move on digital and you don't have an intermediary like a human being, uh, things happen and there are problems. So how do you put a push-oriented uh, marketplace onto a demand-oriented technology? That's the question. That's how you crack the code. And this is where, basically, we saw advances uh, starting at the beginning of this year with generative AI because uh, now we know that uh, communication is the dominant element to shape the banking relationship. Communication typically is human. Now technology is getting more and more human-like, if I can say that, uh, which uh, sort of elevates uh, the previous investments of banks and startups from the digitalization of right uh, through the personalization with machine learning and deep learning into the generative AI era. Of course, uh, this is not uh, free of concerns. Uh, generative AI is not a deterministic framework and algorithm. It's a probabilistic one, so it's important to find ways to control it. It's important to eliminate bias and hallucination. That's not easy, though it is uh, feasible. Uh, we need to be humble in the way uh, we want uh, to use this technology. Um, at the end, uh, um, the, those uh, companies that will be able to apply radical transparency and good risk management uh, will be able to use this uh, a uh, new advancement in AI in order to, as I said, elevate uh, their investments uh, and power up uh, their digital uh, uh, connectivity with clients a bit more. And if I can then for add, uh, uh, why does this matter? It matters because um, something is also rising, uh, there is embedded finance. Um, I launched uh, a paper this year, a research that is based on uh, 12,000 consumer uh, uh, survey uh, worldwide, uh, and the 1,000 uh, uh, banking executives a survey, head of uh, open banking, and uh, the finance, relationship banking, transactional banking, and strategy, to understand where banks are in terms of uh, opening up their architecture, so to allow their uh, um, products and solutions to be consumed uh, by the final clients, not only on the digital apps they power, but also in the apps uh, and super apps of uh, third parties that operate uh, beyond uh, their borders. And of course, uh, the further away you are, the more important it is the simplification of the communication element for people to understand uh, the uh, value proposition. 
Um, not only, I also had the chance of talking with 22 executives uh, of banking and non-banking institutions. They made up of what I call the voice of the maker. So try to really understand massively and also in depth uh, what is happening uh, in terms of uh, embedding financial services somewhere else. You can think about uh, buying up later as an opportunity, but there's more than that uh, in the bank insurance world as well as uh, the investment management perspective. Now, what I discovered... Um, is that effectively uh, financial services shifted. Uh, I remember asking uh, uh, at fintech conferences before the pandemic uh, um, if people had uh, a bank account uh, with uh, a, um, a, a new bank. And, and I typically saw something like 60% of people raising their hand right? in, in fintech at least. Uh, there's a lot of interest and, and comfort in doing that. But then I asked a second question that was, uh, um, how many of you um, consider that uh, to be the primary relationship. So the account where you put your salary or uh, basically you have your main savings. And, and usually everybody used to, to lower the hand. It only happened once that a guy kept the, uh, the hand up and he was the founder of a new bank. So <laughs> there was promotion as well. But now you see that changed them. When we asked the 12,000 consumers worldwide, if they consider their uh, uh, new bank account, like the primary account, 16% of consumers worldwide said that they do so. And in Brazil, the number is 29%. So the extraordinary rise of new bank uh, in uh, um, in Brazil, uh, that is basically, um, you know, fast jump-starting even the growth of uh, uh, the new banks and the digital proposition in some of the Asian countries. And this is also happening here in in Germany. We reviewed uh, how Germans want to consume, uh, like pay for their consumption, uh, looking at uh, uh, dining out uh, or uh, doing the uh, grocery or go shopping online. Yes, Germany is, uh, still is, uh, a cash country, but we saw the rise of the digital wallets less than in the rest of the world, but it's rising here as well. And more interestingly, um, what I discovered is that uh, I asked uh, these uh, 12,000 consumers uh, and 1,000 executives the same questions. I asked the consumer, for example, what do they want from their bank? List of priorities. And I asked the bankers what they think the consumers want from their bank. And here, there's quite a gap. So basically, both of them identify the security as the number one, and that's that's a given, right? So in a sense, uh, uh, banking is to be trusted, there has to be secure. But if you look at uh, what comes uh, right afterwards, uh, the bankers said uh, that consumers want uh, instant payment uh, and buy now pay later. And they don't care about good customer experiences and rewards. Rewards is the last, the least important for bankers. But you know what consumers said? Consumers said they want in the order, good customer experience, more digital wallet and rewards. And that's pretty interesting because I guess this is a difficulty of banks to understand how these become relevant in the digital world and what is the monetization around that, which is essential for consumers to be engaged in. Not only good customer experience now can be better addressed with generative AI. Um, for example, we worked, I worked with one of the largest payment companies in the world that, that used the Gen AI to understand the, the humongous set of a conversation with clients and complaints for customer services, not just to automate them. So now it takes them uh, something like 15 minutes to understand everything that is happening before it took them three weeks to summarize all type of conversations they had with clients. And this example of automation, but also this becomes an opportunity as the granularity is much higher for the customer service to be more relevant. So it's an elevation of the capability of people to talk to people, right, uh, in more meaningful ways. But what matters to me here the most is uh, digital wallets and rewards. Uh, Rewards are uh, basically a loyalty scheme, uh, and uh, loyalty is important, but it can also be expensive. Uh, you hook in clients uh, with um, a reward, not necessarily clients can use the reward efficiently, so they, they wait on the balance sheet of the institution for a while. But now, what about you think about using digital wallets uh, to connect uh, consumers, uh, retailers, uh, with the merchants, uh, the SMEs, which are also part of your banking relationship uh, as, uh, as a client? Um, now, you need a new medium for doing that. Uh, I was so happy that I was invited by the HSBC to launch this embedded finance paper on the main stage of Global Connections in Singapore in September. Um, because uh, what HSBC did, they invited uh, um, 1, 100 of their top corporate clients uh, 
uh, to talk with the bank. And one of the core elements was uh, how can a bank see the clients not anymore like clients, but partners in the better finance space. Now, what we're also learning is that one of the difficulty of banks is that they typically are buyers of technology. They have a hard time of selling technology. Now, the fintech are sellers of technology, not necessarily buyers of technology. And that is where I guess the problem is, but also the opportunity to connect the adults to facilitate uh, through fintech innovation, the embeddedness of financial services uh, in seamless ways uh, for that to be consumed by uh, other industries. Uh, and, and I do believe that 2023 was the year when that was realized that 24% of the banks we surveyed said that embedded finance is core to their business strategy it was not like that before the pandemic and it can only be growing. And Luca, of course, he may be known as the co-founder of Exelon, a credit risk management platform that helps institutional investors to build crowd funding, crowd lending loan portfolios across different platforms globally. Of course, he does have a pretty different perspective on the fintech year 2023 and maybe a little bit on the outlook. Luca, here you go. Yeah, I think um, I might be talking my position here. So I think 2023 has been a bit of a roller coaster for uh, the fintech lending space and digital lending space. Um, and it's been fascinating to watch some of the trends. Um, I think everybody or most of the fintech originators that we saw in the market, they have been have been successful, really big fundraising rounds uh, with institutional firepower coming in and the space professionalizing more and more. Um, but uh, I mean, some of the players we've also seen are struggling. So it's getting tougher to fundraise from institutional investors. And it was pretty interesting to see over the course of the year, just this, you know, diverging trend. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we've been on, on the good side of it, fortunately. Um, but uh, then also going forward, I think it's pretty interesting that, you know, it's not only the segment of fintech lending and digital lending that is gaining more traction, more uh, awareness from institutional investors. But what I find interesting is that you really see ecosystems starting to converge. Um, and I'm saying that because, um, you know, there is more and more appetite also from what we see in the digital asset space to actually connect to source, you know, real world assets. And um, my guess, if I uh, would have to make a prediction for 2024, is that, uh, you know, fintech lending or digital lending and, you know, tokenization uh, and, and the digital asset ecosystem are going to start uh, to be more intertwined going forward um, in the sense that it's, in my guess, not only going to be, you know, traditional wrappers or traditional investment vehicles like funds or securitized notes and and the like but uh, we will probably see a lot of more tokenization going forward as an alternative wrapper to you know lending or loan portfolios well so far um, a recent transaction was announced for instance from fazanara capital um, they have uh, they have uh, created i believe you know a, a tokenized tokenized tranche or tokenized uh, loan portfolio. And uh, if I'm not much mistaken, very recently we saw Taylor, for instance, uh, also coming in with a tokenized part of their SME loan portfolio. And um, my guess is that we will be seeing more of that going forward. No, I think it was really um, uh, so far, you know, this, this new element of uh, investment vehicles that are starting to get Digitized. I mean, in a way, you can see, you know, you have you have the digital front end of SME lending and the processes. Um, and uh, then on the other hand, you know, you're starting to see more or less the, the liability side to be digitized with a different approach. But um, overall, uh, you know, I think the trend is, is recurring that, uh, you know, in fintech lending, especially with rising interest rates um, that I mean, that might come down over the next year, as hinted by some central banks. But I mean, the overall state of the economy, uh, as well as, uh, you know, um, possibility uh, about a recession and uh, some wobbles uh, and then, you know, the emergence or, you know, the, the uh, let's say from the investor side, a bit of a, an increased mindfulness about possible rising defaults that's probably going to <clears throat> going to shape 
the risk management and digital lending also going forward. And it has already been a key focus point in some of the discussions that we've had also with institutional investors and then and, and fintech lenders. So I think that's really going to be key and um, just, you know, having the right tools in place to be able to control the risk in loan portfolios on a granular level or to screen the loan portfolios better. Um, I think that's really going to be key for investors going forward in order to, you know, to have a bridge or to have a way for institutional capital to continue flowing into that sector. And then... Maybe, yeah, sorry if I may jump in. And uh, obviously, uh, there was also one comment uh, that I found quite interesting that obviously, you know, with rising interest rates, um, you know, there is this thing called demand elasticity of credit. So obviously, you know, the higher the rates charge to borrowers, uh, the more impact this has, the more negative impact this can have on obviously, you know, credit demand. Um, and so we've seen, for instance, also uh, one recent post from uh, October uh, that they also saw that, you know, due to the rising interest rates, it's not actually only, you know, a, a better prospect for investors in that sense, um, you know, of, you know, of, of, an, of higher spreads that can be earned. Um, but then again, you know, it's also a tale of how do you balance as a fintech originator, how do you balance um, the demand side of things, right? Because if you need to pass on higher interest rates to borrowers, then it's getting tougher to attract, you know, uh, to, to attract actually supply or interest from, from borrowers. And so finding the right balance between, between these two sides, I think that's, that's crucial. That's key. And of course, there is Ivan. Ivan is the co-founder of an embedded finance startup called Monite, and we also had in our interview based in Berlin. Of course, he also does have a quite different perspective on what was this year all about. So I give the stage to Ivan. Yeah, absolutely. I think for 2023, for us, has been... Um, sort of just, just like for everyone in the startup markets, um, observing a shift from being all these like cool, innovative startup companies that sort of like do some cool stuff and then figure out how to make it work as a business and break even, et cetera, to actually like, uh, you know, a really, really crazy level of diligence, how to make it a business already now, how to watch unit economics closely. And not only this happened for us and other players in the market, but also for our potential customers. And in our market, the behavior largely shifted from trying to build stuff to actually being almost a default buy um, in embedded accounts payable and receivable that we do at Monites. Um, so, so that's been a big one. And then another big trend we observed is that actually, uh, you know, the, the journey of startups seems to be very, very affected by uh, public markets and by what's happening with um, capital availability to a shocking extent, right? So it's been also a shaky year for many companies. Um, a lot of companies um, didn't survive the year. A lot of companies struggled. Um, and so I think it's been a tough year. And so for, for all of those who are still in the game, I think that's an achievement by itself. Um, raising any money this year was an achievement. Um, keeping good people around was an achievement. So it's been a tough year that also brought a lot of um, great opportunities around. And I think, um, at least to me, being in the startup industry for you know over 10 years, um, this is the first year where I can say that startups are really shifting to become closer to real businesses. So that's that's my short recap of 23, but overall positive and really looking forward into 2024. Yeah, for 2024, look, my, my outlook is actually positive. I think uh, we'll continue seeing, um, you know, hard, hard conditions to raise capital. We'll continue seeing um, that businesses, um, that startups need to become businesses in many ways, right? Show good unit economics, that multiples will be lower um, than in 2021, right? And all this stuff, um, so the, this, this shift that I talked about in 23 will continue. Um, and then I have a couple of um, interesting predictions when it comes to what I expect to happen in 2024. One of them is a large talent migration. I think um, at least I would predict that um, there will be a wave of people migrating. Um, some of that will be from late stage companies that are now a little bit stuck. It's hard to raise money uh, post Series B or even for Series B. So a lot of people who were in an exciting joke growth trajectory will find themselves in stagnation, will look for more opportunities. And this wave will split into two main buckets. 
uh, in my view, right? Um, so the first bucket will become founders. And that's where we see a lot of pre-seed activity happening already now with like X, Y, X, Revolut, X, this and that type of people um, going to market, investors willing to fund it, investors willing to take risks, but also different condition supply in terms of business model and economics. And then the second part of these guys actually um, it was, was what I'm seeing could join some early stage companies like one I'd like, um, Seeds or Series A, but also I expect a portion of them to go into corporates and into incumbents. And so I think we'll see a lot of talent migration uh, from some types of companies to other types of companies. And also we'll see companies going bust. Uh, probably there will be a lot of them going bust, which means that there will be more and more talent available in the market. A lot of great people will become available and more technology will be created, but also there will be great opportunity to for businesses that are doing well um, to hire some new additional um, great talent. So that's 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 my first tra- prediction. Basically, a large migration we see in the startup world, or a fairly large. And then the second prediction, kind of going from the first one, I think what we're starting to see, and this this might sound very controversial, but what we are starting to see is that incumbents are actually getting a lot cleverer. In fact, some of the banks we're talking to at Monite, like they hired great people, they actually have really good teams in place, and the tide is shifting. These guys are not as behind as they used to be. Some of them become even leaders in some parts of, for example, embedded finance. And they are very, very much um, in a great position now with interest rates being high, um, especially banks, right? And other incumbents as well. Their business is actually doing really well. They're able and willing to attract top talent. They're changing in many ways how they think about product strategy and vision. And I think when, when we talked about all these incumbents like a few years back, Everybody was like, yeah, these guys are like forever behind. So I think this forever is starting to turn for now, or maybe even kind of starting to turn into another direction where some of these incumbents might actually catch up very quickly because they have money to throw at it. And if they get the right people on board, for which the timing is actually really good right now, um, then they're in a great position to, you know, build something good, to buy some good companies, um, to really spin off the right propositions to clients. And in the end, they are actually in a very comfortable position um, compared to a lot of challengers out there, fortunately or unfortunately. So my second prediction is that we'll see incumbents becoming stronger, uh, not weaker. There will be exceptions, of course, right? Um, not every incumbent will, will make it, but I think we'll see a couple of really successful examples in 24. And then my third prediction is, is a little bit more um, in the area of fintech. I think the whole embedded finance uh, theme has been challenged very, very hard um, in the last year or two uh, with a lot of fintechs going down, a lot of embedded finance players supplying fintechs also not feeling great. And so what I think is going to happen is that a lot of embedded finance that survives will actually go up market and start serving enterprise customers with real use cases. And then the second point here is the real use cases really matter. We used to live in a world with a lot of visionary selling, with a lot of like signed contracts, with a lot of vanity value being created or like sort of visionary value being created, but without economic proof. I think these times are gone now. And in 24, I expect to see even stricter diligence on why embedded something makes sense specifically in this place. So that, that's, that's my outlook um, for FinTech. And while it sounds banal, I think we have never seen such a level of like diligence and deep dive by investors, by experts, by customers as we see now. And signed revenue or signed contracts or people like regularly not going live, which used to be the norm in embedded finance for a few years, um, I think will stop being the norm and we'll see the evolution of proper business cases. And we'll also see, um, again, some players uh, probably either needing to shift the model uh, or feeling really bad just because um, the market will be very tough in terms of raising financing when the revenue doesn't get real fast enough. And this is, of course, one of the challenges for Monet as well that we look forward to solving in 2024. Last but not least, Kimo, our specialist for central bank digital currency and advisor to central banks, is here with us from London. He, of course, has also quite different perspective on what was going on in the fintech and finance world in 2023. Kimo, please go ahead. I think the clear two main topics this year have been uh, liquidity and uh, fraud. 
Uh, and there are sort of uh, specific reasons, I think, for both. Uh, so if I start maybe with liquidity, of course, the interest rates going up. Uh, so that makes money more expensive. Uh, and that makes liquidity more expensive. And that makes uh, optimizing liquidity more important for for pretty much everyone, like uh, from uh, large banks, global banks, to smaller banks, to corporates, to uh, to small uh, fintech uh, enterprises uh, like uh, like ourselves. Uh, liquidity is a very important topic, and um, um, so Joe, you know that we work mostly around payments, and that's why I've been also here on these central bank digital currency broadcasts, and um, and um, we've been. Uh, Pretty much over the last two decades already, I've uh, been working with uh, large value payment systems uh, um, like um, CHAPS in the UK, um, uh, where banks make payments with each other to make them more liquidity efficient. And uh, I think the ones that uh, we were simulating together with the Bank of England maybe a decade ago, ago helped uh, the UK bank save four billion in in uh, liquidity in in that system from down from twenty four four billion down from twenty, so quite a large percentage as well. And so what we've been doing in the last couple of years is uh, bring that type of technology for the banks as well, so that the banks can compress uh, their liquid holdings. So how much uh, money they're holding or buffers they're holding for, for being able to make all the payments that their customers ask them to do or, or that they want to make by themselves for the proprietary activities that they're doing. So I think that's been really, really um, something that's kicked off this year um, because uh, because uh, the environment has changed from a long time of zero interest rates into really having positive interest rates. And uh, everyone is uh, experiencing that hit, uh, how the um, liquidity is like, actually getting costly. In some other countries, we're also thinking about uh, uh, mechanisms for corporates to uh, optimize their liquidity. Um, this is not maybe on an intraday basis, but on a longer term basis, uh, uh, sort of looking at, uh, at mechanisms, how we could... Uh, uh, when there is information about all the invoices that companies have sent each other to say that, hey, what if this company would pay earlier to that company so that that company could pay earlier to that company so that that company could pay earlier to the next company? Uh, and uh, in order to, in, in, in that way, in a way, optimize the, uh, the, um, the whole economy um, and um, then create buffers, excess capital that the companies now would be holding so that they could be making investments uh, or not having to uh, cut down their operations or staff uh, because they hit liquidity problems, uh, which I think sort of is a, is a rather big idea. And I've been advocating it uh, um, pretty much the whole year in different parts of the world. And, uh, and uh, we're getting quite a bit of traction in a number of countries who are, who are sort of thinking that that could help uh, protect the downside when the economy is not doing well, but then also create a Quite, quite a competitive advantage uh, when when things are going well because uh, everyone in the economy just gets paid earlier and need, needs less operating capital to do so. And uh, the, the second piece uh, around fraud, um, I think that's uh, so. If the if the liquidity is usually a question when we have larger amounts of larger payments between banks or large corporates. Uh, the fraud is something that uh, really touches, I think, everyone. Uh, probably everyone has received emails. Uh, uh, trying to uh, get their bank details or uh, make them payments to someone or scams uh, that uh, that try to get to your monies. And I think in the past, uh, pretty much after COVID, a uh, lot of countries started to to um, um, bring a lot of uh, new consumers into the uh, realm of uh, digital payments. Uh, this um, um, sort of a financial inclusion and digitization of, of the economies has uh, meant that um, we have now in large parts of the world uh, faster payment systems. So it's very easy to move money from uh, one person to another. Uh, it's instantaneous. Uh, but at the same time, we have brought in hundreds of millions of people uh, that uh, used to use cash and now have to learn how to use uh, digital payments. So they are very... Um, uh, sort of like a profitable targets for international gangs uh, to target and try to scam them out of their money. So, so I think uh, this is happening a lot in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East, uh, but also I think uh, um, 
in, in Europe. But I think it comes just in very many forms. And so what we are sort of working mostly is around what we call consumer fraud. So consumers getting scammed, uh, they're making payments to, uh, to fraudsters they don't want to make payments to. And then these fraudsters are, are um, onward mulling the money very quickly in the instant payment system, uh, trying to conceal the, uh, the source of the money and then take it out in cash or or crypto, or, or move it somewhere out, out out from the system. So there's a sort of window of opportunity to uh, help them uh, actually stop those payments uh, and uh, then return the monies to the victim. Yeah. So um, so what what happens is that um, the um, the fraudsters when they get their money quickly uh, through the faster payment systems or instant payment systems from the uh, from the victims. Uh, they start to move it around through mule accounts within the system many times. So in 20 minutes, it can already have moved several accounts forward. Um, and of course, that creates it very difficult for the for the uh, to recover that money money to the victim. Um, and uh, as a consequence, I think a lot of people are losing trust into digital payments. Um, the same way that I don't answer phone calls anymore because most of them are scam or spam. Uh, or I'm, I'm very distrust, distrustful on any SMSs that I receive uh, because they probably lead to links that I should not be clicking. Uh, and we don't want that same thing happen to, uh, to payment systems because they're too critical for the functioning of the economy. And especially in countries that have digitized very quickly, um, there's real risk that uh, large amounts of people start to consider them just this trustful and stop using them and return back to using cash, which of course is uh, much less efficient for the sort of like uh, economy than, than being able to make purchases online and pay online. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and uh, I wish Happy New Year to everyone. 2024 will be an amazing year for innovation. Awesome. Thanks, Jörn. The same to you. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Merry Christmas and Happy Coming New Year. Merry Christmas, everyone, from my behalf as well. And uh, more exciting uh, and positive news for the, for the next year. <laughs> it has been a great pleasure to have you all here in the FinTech Review 2023. Hope to see you soon again. Everybody out there, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Frohe Weihnachten und einen guten Rutsch. That's all, folks. Find more news, streams, events, and interviews at www.startuprad.io. Remember, sharing is caring.